Welcome to the bilge pumps, where a bunch of drips start ship. So now we're on to the event itself. Part two of um, Toronto. So we've done the whole working up to this point from World War One through the 20s and 30s, the development of the technologies and the concepts through to the events of September, October and November um, leading up to the actual action. And so we're now at November 10, the day before the action. So um, this is the point where Operation Crack, uh, Force F being Romillies and a couple of heavy cruisers and uh, destroyers, manages to sneak their way through the Sicilian Channel at night. Uh, the Italian um, Italians let them through because they don't really know what the hell was going on. So Our submarine does stuff. manage to fire at them, but it, well, it's, it's the whole thing that's been going on with so many torpedoes, but which me and Drac are supposed not to say again, because apparently it does upset people when we say it. But it suffers from, if I'm not mistaken from the reports I've read, premature detonation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, t t the, well, it needs a lot of things going right. I mean, it's, it's not like torpedoes don't work like they do in computer games. No, they you've don't. Got, you've got to hit your target basically at a nice 90 degrees, at the right speed, at the right depth, um, with all the different little bits and pieces connected to each other. No, there's, there's all these things called mechanics and physics. And tides. <laughs> and currents. Uh, yeah, well, look, you know, Romilius gets through, but Romilius being an R-class uh, needs to take a pit stop at Malta, but uh, they can turn them around within a matter of hours. So, um, you know, she comes out with Ajax, Sydney, and some destroyers and freighters um, in the early afternoon. Um, by this point, a swordfish that had been sent to Malta to pick up the RAF, uh, the latest RAF reconnaissance photos, after waiting for 24 hours, finally gets them and manages to make her way back to Illustrious. In no way, shape or form does Charles Lamb engage in minor larceny to secure a ship, uh, a, a cockpit full of um, potatoes. At our minor subterfuge and espionage on his fellow service to get hold of pop up of the required pictures. And he is a no gentleman, way, an honest man, and it would be completely above these things. And in no way did his um, <coughs> Rear Admiral Lister uh, tell him to go and um, put his tab to his uh, staff officer to make up any, uh, make up for any expenses incurred. <laughs> so, yes. <coughs> Um, we want yeah, these these things just don't happen. This is not history. <laughs> Everything happens just like it does in the official, written, vetted, documented, censored, politically correct mm -hmm. official naval history documents uh, publications. Yes. Okay, just like the <laughs> ADM files in the National Archives say, that is how history happens. Those okay. official reports are 100% right and correct and in no way sanitized. And which is why you should absolutely not read personal accounts, such mm. as those written by the likes of Charles Lamb. Yes. Okay, or, next up. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I say, or, or, or indeed question why certain people have interesting items left over from the war that mysteriously appeared in their ownership and pr probably missing from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we better not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's a big rabbit hole. <laughs> All right, so dawn of November 11, you know, the illustrious and its uh, air crew now know that um, all the pieces are in place. The Italians are still in Toronto, but the battleships are still there, cruisers are still there. They haven't come out. So the mission is to Magala. There's no sense that anyone's alarmed. There's no extra patrols, no extra destroyers or, uh, or um, um, torpedo boats zipping around. Not even any extra um, surveillance fl flights from the um, Italian Air Force. To be fair, Ark Royal had kind of taken care of those. 
Yeah, well, possibly, yes. You know, with, uh, Let's be honest, the, uh, you can only do so many surveillance flights when you've managed to lose, not just... And the thing that's always pointed out, again, whenever we do actually... Uh, when Ark Royals attacks are discussed at all... <laughs> on the, they are the, sorry. At no least point. it's not Benny. When our uh, when our Royals attacks are discussed at all, we talk about the aircraft being lost. But actually, the bigger thing was the stores those swordfish took out, and the fitters and en- maintainers they they injured, and of course killed. It, these things have a big knock on impact on your ability to actually launch any kind of operation to maintain things in the air you need and en- you need those skilled aircraft engineers and maintainers you need those technicians and you need those stores because you losing an airframe is one thing it's annoying it's problematic you have to build a new one but losing the people who maintain not just one aircraft airframe but a dozen airframes that's a big thing and if you doubt Dr. Clark on that, just go to our bilge pump episode where we look at the um, <coughs> the, the the plight of the aero engineers behind uh, the Falklands operation. I think it's episode twenty-one. It was. Yes, some some yeah. very creative engineering going on there to keep the uh, helicopters and sea harriers flying. So November eleven basically passes quite quietly. Um, the Italians get enough information back to see that the convoys and warships are all, instead of converging on Malta, dispersing from Malta. So they form this opinion in, in their own minds that whatever the British were up to has been done. And uh, in this instance, they think that they'd managed to push this reinforcement group through the Sicilian Channel, which is no minor feat on its own. So relax might not be the best word, but they're not exactly um, as worried as they were <clears throat> a few hours earlier, which is why when <clears throat> at 6 p.m. illustrious and a group of destroyers, along with 4-6, um, the light cruisers, uh, HMA Sydney, Orion, Ajax, and a couple of tribals, I'm sure that Dr. Clark can tell me exactly which ones they were. Nubian and Mohawk (laughs) going along to just say, just they just came to say hello. They're just friendly little destroyers that are just coming to say hello to anyone that wants to be said hello to with 4.7 inch guns. And in and in you know distinctly non-political terms, they make a they make a severe turn to the left. Yes, (laughs) they they really (laughs) do turn hard left. And uh, start heading north towards. Honestly, the they go so hard left that it should probably be HMS Tartar and HMS Cossack making the turn because <laughs> they they are more of a a left wing country at this point. They <laughs> represent their tribe too at this time. <laughs> Although and, and maybe with... the Cossacks and the Tartars wouldn't quite agree with that particular turn. So, given the hour of the day, six p.m., it's not quite dark yet, but it's getting later in the evening. Um, the Italians don't notice this. So at this time of the day, it's the weather is pretty much ideal for a night operation. It's a full moon. Um, the weather is slightly overcast, seven tenth cloud, um, but no strong wind, no rain. So it's pretty much an ideal situation for ships to be moving at night without being noticed, but for aircraft to be flying and still see where they're going. Um, at dusk, a Sunderland flying boat risks flying over Toronto. It doesn't normally do that during the day because even though they are somewhat of a porcupine, it's still um, not exactly safe for a Sunderland to be flying over uh, the enemy's mainland in uh, broad daylight. This uh, Sunderland overflight is actually reasonably significant because it was the actual final green light because it said, yes, even now, even after the earlier RAF overflights, these battleships are still there and on top of that she you know gets uh, the italians uh, a little bit on edge and they start opening fire uh with their um you know the, the, the toronto's defenses because she was picked up on the audio um, direction finding system uh, and they didn't know what it was 
being you know that much sort of cloud so they just open fire and one of the stories that actually affects later i've again jamie if you've not heard of this then correct me but i've heard a story that because of the overflight and they're firing at her some of those shots that they were firing for air defense actually landed in the town and got a basically a phone call from the mayor to the commander telling them off and saying you know you've done damage to the town all these things which then meant the commander went to made it told the, uh, the the gunners basically you have to be sure what you're hitting your firing at before you start firing which makes them less uh, makes them when the swordfish come in actually firing being more careful with their firing because they're worried about going into the town so they're already careful before the sun went over after the sun after basically getting told off for quite understandable reasons but getting told off that makes them even more cautious when they're firing and if the viewers aren't sure yes drac is eating madeira cake and torturing us because we <laughs> haven't got food or certainly not madeira cake mm -hmm. um look I, i'm certainly aware that uh, the particularly the fleet in the harbour had been given instructions to be very careful about their fire, um, specifically with the main armament. <laughs> I'm sure you probably understand why. Um, so, you know, that story doesn't sound completely wildly off track. Um, anyway, so now you've got your briefing. Um, the pilots are assembled. They're, they've, been, they've, they've been pouring over the Nice high, high resolution photographs, been pouring over the pre prepared diagrams and charts by um, Admiral Lister's staff. Uh, and they had a, you know, a very good idea of what their missions were. Um, and watching all of this was Commander Richard Opie, the third United States Navy. Now, if he, if Illustrious by any chance had been sunk and he'd been pulled out of the water by the Italians, they were entirely within their rights to immediately shoot him as a spy. Because at this point of the war, the United States neutrality did not permit his presence on a Royal Navy warship. It was clear breach of um, the various conventions of this time. But, but the US Navy, it's information. The US Navy didn't care. They wanted to know the difference between reality and theory. And he was one of the first to be put on British warships. And he got probably the best, uh, you know, the, the best ticket of the lot aboard HMS Illustrious on a major strike against the harbour. You know, this is mm -hmm. the first time this has actually been put into practice. Thought about for a long time, first time it's been put into practice. From here, it's just a matter of waiting. Um, they need to, yeah, the, the idea was for them to arrive, the first wave to arrive about 11 o'clock at night. Um, the number of flights, the, the number of aircraft weren't optimal because a third swordfish had been lost the day before. They managed at that point to discover that there was a fuel tank aboard Illustrious contaminated with, um, believe it or not, sand and mould, because the tanker that they had refueled that particular fuel tank from had not been properly uh, maintained. So, yes, basically they solved that problem by just turning off the taps from that uh, aviation fuel tank. Um, possibly Cunningham solved that problem by having a conversation with the person who had been responsible for maintaining the tanker at a later date, which I'm, I'm was sure a conversation that... which did not involve biscuits or sitting down or tea. <laughs> I imagine not. Um, now, the, the plan was quite specific. Once again, they had uh, each, there were two strikes. Each strike consisted of a flight of swordfish configured as flare droppers, carrying about six or eight flares, but also um, about four 250 kilogram bombs. Their job was to drop the flares, illuminate the harbour, and as part of the process, bomb the fuel facilities. Second flight was the torpedo bombers. Third flight was the, well, shallow dive bombers. They weren't going to do deep dive bombing because of the um, um, cables and the uh, balloons. 
because uh, they well, a shallow bomb meant that they could easier fly around these things if they came across them. The whole okay. point was that if they were focusing in in this sort of strategy, you're using the flares to light up the harbour, but you don't want it's kind of like when you're firing flares as a warship. This is the idea. You've got one gun maybe illuminating the flares, but you've only got one ship maybe firing these flares or one bomber aircraft dropping the flares so that it illuminates the target but doesn't illuminate the attacking aircraft mm. or the attacking ships. This is the whole thing. So it might sound very strange to say you're going to be using flares as part of an attack. In, uh, to our modern mindset, when we go in with all the night vision gear and all that stuff we have, but actually... Today, if you were going in for an attack, you might also be tempted to use flares as part of your attacking profile to blind infrared systems which are trying to seat you. So, uh, again, these bright lights suddenly turning up, uh, make it illuminating the targets to allow you to target up, also spoiled the night vision of the air gunners and of the other people involved in trying to attack the aircraft and defend. Mm -hmm. So it actually is a lot more sensible than it might initially sound. And even and, even once the aircraft have passed by the players and are on their attack runs, <coughs> it's quite difficult to aim and shoot your gun in the direction of the aircraft if immediately behind it there's a magnesium flare going off, glaring light into your eyes. You might be able to see the aircraft, but you're probably not going to be have a tremendous amount of fun looking at it. It no. had another advantage. It convinced the um, high angle larger caliber anti-aircraft gunners that the attack was coming from medium altitude. So all eyes were up as opposed mm. to looking at the horizon to see those swordfish coming around the islands and picket boats uh, with their wheels skipping across the tops of the waves. They literally were that low. Coming into the heart. Uh, there is a, there are debates as to whether it was the wheels were skipping across the top of the waves or at mm. some point were going possibly submarine. Uh, but they were they were let's put it this way: the swordfish were flying low, yes. very and, very low. And, and you've got to remember that this is where the swordfish came into its own. It could fly low, it could fly slow, and not only could it fly low and slow. It could fly very well low and slow, which means that if they saw an obstacle, they could just jink around it without falling out of the sky. And that's exactly what they were doing. Yeah. They were flying along at that height, seeing a barge in front of them. That barge had cables going up to a balloon. And they would just simply jink around it because they could. So they basically flew underneath the cables of the barrage balloons and the, one, the, and the main anchor cable, they could just simply fly around. And the same for the various picket boats in terms of the AA the flak platforms. They saw them, they would fly around, or simply fly around them. Basically, you know, if you're thinking in terms of trying to repeat this with an Avenger, you couldn't do it because they didn't have that low speed. They didn't have the ability to be uh, able to respond at the last minute to a, a, a something that comes out of the darkness right in front of you. To be uh, honest, I wouldn't try, like to try it with a Kate either. Uh, that's the Mitsubishi Type 97, the Japanese one. I wouldn't like to try it. They're just, it's just not an operation you would want to do in pretty much any of the higher performance, usually what we would describe, uh, what would be described as the better in top Trump's terms, torpedo bombers. Because the Swordfish has... Thanks to its biplane design, but also it's the other tenets of its design, which means it's it's going to sound strange, but the airframe on a swordfish can sort of flex a bit, which with the more rigid airframes of the uh, faster aircraft can't do. And that flex in a way allows them to do take a lot of damage and a lot of punishment down flying at low level. And that's what they are doing in this operation. They are really, really low. Absolutely. And this is also happening as while everyone's distracted and looking up. Yeah. Um, it's not really until they're actually bouncing into the harbour that the Italians realise that this is a two-pronged attack. Um, so it's a surprise. 
it, it, they succeed in surprising defences that are as prepared as they're going to be, pretty much. 50% of the, the um, armament of the warships is armed, as a matter of course, all day, all night. 100% at dawn and dusk. The defences around Taranto had been busy all night, first with the Sunderland, and as the swordfish were flying in, they saw this volcano erupting on the horizon, which was Taranto. For whatever reason, the, the gunners had been spooked and had started firing blindly into the sky again. So by the time that the swordfish make their way over and into the harbour, this is the third time that night that the air raid sirens had gone off, the civilians had stormed off to their um, bomb shelters and the gunners had started searching for targets. Previous two times that search had been in vain. Mm. Um, so I guess you know whether or not exactly to what extent they were getting a little bit irked by this whole process is you know, one combine that know. with having been told off for some of their shots having fallen into places where they weren't supposed to and honestly I'd say the British have done a great piece of psychological warfare uh, again Cunningham it's the one thing he does his patent party trick is I'm going to confuse you there's also another element here though is that Cunningham might not have had as much to do with it necessarily um, while these poor old swordfish were on their way to Toronto for the first strike, they hit a bit more clown than they expected, and a few of them got separated from each other. Mm. One of them got separated quite severely and was completely alone. And from the uh, various um, personal accounts I read of that first wave, it seems that one of them, that got separated, Swordfish L4M, had probably opened his throttle up a little bit too much to catch up with the main body and overtaken them. Yes. So the indication is that he arrived over Toronto a full 15 to 20 minutes earlier than the rest of the first. And it was his aircraft that the Italian um, diaphones heard didn't know where it was and were just sort of blazing away at while he was circling just out to sea, waiting to... <laughs> waiting for everyone else to show up. <laughs> wait, waiting, for, waiting to hopefully spot the others as they fly past. Um, so, look, yeah, fortune favours the brave, but also fortune favours those who plan for every other contingency than the few that slip through the gaps. <laughs> and sometimes those contingencies actually work out in your favour. Um... So the, again, the, the, the first wave, the, the dive bombers move in on the cruisers and destroyers in the second harbour near, near um, Piccolo. Um, and that's what drew all the attention. And to the surprise of the attacking swordfish pilots, there was no searchlights. Well, there's two things you could be possibly doing with no searchlights. One, if you turn them on, that's great, but that creates light and dark and it allows you to hide. The, the aircraft which aren't illuminated can hide that much more. And there is also the theory that if, with search, without using search, searchlights, illuminate the positions you need to attack. For example, if the ships had turned on their searchlights, yay, that's great. We're now illuminating exactly where we are. So there yeah, are because... reasons for not turning on your searchlights, but also I would say myself, if you don't turn on your searchlights at this time, you're basically firing blind into the night. That's pretty much uh, the sort of theory that uh, one of the, the, the swordfish pilots, Charles Lamb, came up with. Um, he was flying one of the flare droppers. So his job was to lay a pattern of flares, orbit, lay another pattern of flares, and then before he left, drop his bombs in the fuel tanks. So he had the self-described box seats. He saw everything that was going on underneath him. And his uh, theory was two things. Pretty much what you said, um, warships didn't use their searchlights because a couple of the um, Italian heavy cruisers actually open up with their secondary armament and uh, light hand aircraft machine guns initially in the first few minutes of the attack, but these two were sitting in the darker centre of the Mayor Piccolo, the, 
the lagoon inside of the of Toronto. And they quickly realized that if they stopped shooting, they would be lost in the darkness. So they did. So those two heavy cruisers, which the dive bombing swordfish were looking for, couldn't be found and stayed unseen. Uh, you know, is this good or bad? They weren't helping their um, compatriots. I don't know. But I, I, I imagine that um, protecting a heavy cruiser, which is a pretty, you know, is a capital ship, keeping out of sight is a fairly wise move. Um, but the second reason the, the martial spirit though feels a bit dulled because you're not <laughs> doing anything the the other reason um charles lamb came up with while he was circling up above was that if these ships and shore bases had opened up with their searchlights particularly on the low flying swordfish all they would have achieved was to blind each other and probably hit each other as well let's yeah. be honest at those levels when the swordfish is coming in that low, you aim your guns at it. You are not probably going to hit the swordfish, but you're probably going to hit the ship the other side of the bay. Mm. And this that's all the town, all the defences, yeah. or is, this, anything. This is one of the things I think, I can't remember if I pointed out last last recording session or whether I pointed out in the stream somewhere, but the with the slightly hodgepodge way the Italian ships were laid out, there was an awful lot of potential crossfire going on where they, they could have hit each other in multiple and multiple each other's <laughs> because of the different bearings they were moored at. Whereas um, a few months later, when you look at Pearl Harbor, at least with battleship row, okay, fair enough. The ships on the inner row can only really fire at high altitude, stuff like the dive bombers. But if the ships on the outer side of battleship row want to open up at torpedo bombers coming in, at least they don't have anything directly in the way that could be absorbing their shots other than enemy aircraft they also would have been uh, uh, but, and, and, that, and that's exactly what the swordfish pilots report is happening in those opening moments of them entering the harbor uh, they report seeing the cruisers that were around the battleships opening fire with their medium armor armaments and those shells zipping past the swordfish and either into the town of Toronto or into the merchant vessels which were clustered around the outsides and then those guns stopped so it was uh, the, the Italians to their credit realized very quickly that this is what was happening and it was a problem because of the close confines of the harbor that even the lighter caliber weapons were doing this very similar thing and the swordfish pilots noticed very quickly that there was a bit of a safe zone. If they were flying at that level with their wingtips touching the wave tops, that the Italians wouldn't shoot at them. It was only when they lifted up a little bit higher that the gunners would feel safe, that they weren't going to hit their neighbouring ships and that they would open fire. So once again, you know, the ability of the string bag to just basically skip across the wave tops like that is what let them in, but also is what kept them flying once they got in. It's basically it's one of those uh, it's one of those scenarios where you're sitting there going, everyone who's looking at this on a normal metric would be thinking you should be having the most advanced, most super aircraft you can possibly have. And yes, you would probably do the attack in a different way. But with Taranto itself, the very tenants of the swordfish, its design are actually the key enablers which enable it to do this. The only thing that could have made it, would have sort of made any significant difference is if you'd had more of them, really. Because that's the only way this attack gets any more successful, is if you'd had actually more swordfish. If you had more other aircraft turn up, i.e., let's say the bombing had been being done by skewers, that would have been great allowed you more swordfish to go in low for the torpedo attack but i don't really see that in that improving things hmm. you and know, dramatically and you also i mean okay well as we'll see later on one or two swordfish are lost but you still have this remarkable durability of the swordfish where a lot of the heavier caliber aa ammunition that would otherwise have if you're talking about a an all metal monoplane probably would have shredded it in moments will just go straight through the canvas and not actually notice it's hit anything so even even if you were to substitute in a devastator or a b5n or 
put some skewers or dauntlesses or and somehow or, or fix whatever. it so that those aircraft hmm. could actually do the low level yeah. maneuvers like the swordfish. But even even if they're doing exactly the same maneuvers, they're probably all going to get shot down a lot faster because a lot more of the stuff that hits them is actually going to detonate and cause a lot more problems for the aircraft very quickly. As opposed to with the swordfish, where it's in weirdly enough, it's only actually really the light AA that causes you problems because machine gun rounds and the Italian equivalent of a 20 millimeter are probably about the only things that are going to actually realize that they've hit anything substantial. Unless, of course, you score a direct hit on the engine, but then that's probably much the only key target outside of the pilot. And there again, if you score a direct hit on the engine, it doesn't really much matter what you're hitting the engine mm. with. A direct hit on the engine is going to cause problems. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it, no one should think that uh, the Italian anti-aircraft fire was by any means light. No. They were firing, it's just that they were firing at their minimum safe depression, which mm. was too high for the swordfish. So they were, there, there was, you know, uh, Charles Lamb, once again, he's got a, a great quote, and uh, I'll read it out. It says, before the first swordfish had dived to the attack, the full-throated roar from the guns of six battleships and the blasts from the cruisers and destroyers made the harbour defences seem like a sideshow. So he's emphasising that the actual ships themselves were putting up the most firepower. Mm. From my position, I was in no danger whatsoever and could watch proceedings at leisure. I have never been in less danger in any attack than I was that night when the rest of the squadron were flying into the jaws of hell. I was convinced that none of the torpedoing aircraft could have su survived. Mm. So he's up there, up with the flares, looking down at these, this carpet of anti-aircraft fire, mm. probably not realising that that carpet was just above the heads <laughs> of, the, of, the, um, of the torpedoing swordfish. Mm. And I think the other thing that is, is also the type of anti-aircraft guns because it's the Italian ships are pretty much the only things present that have anything of what you might determine to be a medium caliber anti-aircraft gun. Most, most, if not all of the defenses of Taranto itself are either anti-aircraft machine guns, which mm. outside of something to do if you happen to be in the cupola of a tank that's under attack, are pretty much useless at this point. They, they, yeah, they, had, support... they had some World War One vintage four-inch guns, which were basically mm. only suited for, you know, high-level, um, yeah, you know, kind of flak. So yeah, that's the thing. You've you've got the the shore defences there. This mixture of machine guns, which aren't really useful against much any, of anything, and heavy anti-aircraft guns, which have a slow rate of fire, a slow rate of tracking, and are fine if you're dealing with twin-engine or four-engine medium and heavy bombers. To a certain at degree, altitude, in, at altitude, probably, but, yeah. but even though the swordfish is relatively slow and it's a relatively substantial aircraft for a single engine aircraft, it's still a heck of a lot more maneuverable and a harder target than a twin engine bomber. So and, that that's why everyone, in naval terms, is investing in medium caliber anti aircraft, whether it be thirty seven millimeter, forty millimeter, fifty fifty seven millimeter, or or even up to the 90 millimeter guns, I would argue that these this kind of medium caliber is really what you need to be engaging single engine carrier borne attack aircraft. But that's the one type of caliber that's completely missing from the Taranto naval defenses and only present on the Italian ships. And the point you have to make is that whilst the Sawfish is a relatively slow aircraft, OK, compared to other options at the time, the, if you are aiming at an aircraft, let's say, up at high altitude, and you're tracking that, it's moving that way. But at its, it's relatively slow to move it, because it's, it's not moving as far on the axis. If it's down here, and it's moving the same way, you have to move a lot faster. And that's the thing. Actually, for some of the guns, the aircraft were actually down there and moving, and you're, you're, you're stretching the gun, you're... You're trying to get everything, and it's just not designed for it. And it's just a case of, oh, this is... The, these are... What's the real problem for the I Italians is we're not saying they designed bad defences. For defence against dealing with a heavy bomber attack, they were they were probably very, they were very good. For defence against dealing, let's say, with Devastators or Avengers or anything like that, 
they've probably got fairly good defenses in line for them. There is pretty much one aircraft in service as a frontline torpedo aircraft, which could make this attack in this way at that time. And that's not saying it's the best, and it's not saying it's the worst. It's just saying it's unique. Suited to the job. Yeah. And it's suited to the job that it's being asked for. Basically, the British, the Navy is asking the swordfish to do the job which it was actually designed and developed for. That's a rare thing in war. It's rare you get a scenario where the aircraft or the ship or anything is actually doing the specific job it was designed for. You know, track, Jamie. How often can you think of an aircraft actually doing, or any ship or anything doing, the specific job it was specifically designed for? Hmm. Actually, to a T. Because let's be honest, the Swordfish was designed to do night torpedo strikes, and if they were happened to, the enemy happened to be in harbour, that was even better. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, there's it's usually just... compromise somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. It, things didn't look as though they were turning out that great, though. Yeah. Because at the very start, there were problems. So what, one of the first aircraft into the harbour, uh, I think it was L4A was the registration number on the aircraft, was one of the first aircraft in. And basically, in terms of the British, it was never seen again. Um, it dove in to release its torpedo against uh, Cavour and did so successfully, but it took hits from the, um, the battleship and one of the uh, nearby destroyer and was seen to um, ditch, basically, uh, alongside of a floating dock. The British didn't see this. They, all they knew was that this aircraft didn't return home. Um, in this instance, both the pilot and the observer escaped. They pulled themselves out of the water, sat on the dock, and watched the rest of the attack unfold and were captured later that night um, by the Italians. So one of the... Um, survivors his name was um i haven't got his first name but he's scarlet i believe he was one of the it was the observer he says we put a wingtip in the water i couldn't tell i just fell out the back into the sea we were only about 20 feet up it wasn't very far to drop i never tie myself in on these missions then old williamson came up a bit later and we hung about by the aircraft which still had its tail sticking out of the water Chaps ashore were shooting at it. The water was boiling, so I swam off to a floating dock and climbed on board. We didn't know we'd done any good with our torpedo, though we might have, because they all looked a bit long in the face, the wops. So, you know, um, I guess slow speed, um, again, means that when he hit the water, it wasn't really that bad a, an impact. Um, although also, I suppose you could always you're not quite that... sure whether it was actual enemy damage which took it out, or if it was so low it did actually <laughs> decide to turn into a submarine. <laughs> it's just like, please wait until the swordfish has come to a full and complete stop and stepped out of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah. This is the trouble with low, really, really low level flying, because as I said, some of those wheels were going... You said skimming the waves. I said, well, some of the wheels were actually, they mm. seem to be coming back very, very wet and haven't gone through it. Uh, if you go, if you're that level already, if you, let's say when you're dropping the torpedo, you will, when they're dropping a torpedo, an aircraft sort of actually tends to jump up. But if you're not holding it, let's say you haven't got it all, all the errands fixed together, it can actually do a sort of thump maneuver. Where one side, where it sort of jumps up, but one side actually dips down, and I'm wondering in that scenario. Whenever I've read it, I've always wondered whether it was actually enemy firepower which brought them down, or whether it was that maneuver just as they were. Because if you know, you drop. Let uh, there are so many different things I can compare this to, but I'm not going to because it would get me into trouble in the comment section. But 
if you were carrying a heavy weight and you get to let it go, you do tend to go, oh, mm. I can stretch up. Well, that's what happens with the aircraft when they drop torpedoes. And actually, that's usually some of the most dangerous moments for torpedo bombers because they drop the torpedo and they go. Mm. And also, to be honest, with the with the the necessary drop height for the torpedoes to enter the water properly and for the, the cable reel that's keeping the nose up to work properly, they're swordfish are probably in the odd position of when it comes time to drop the torpedo they're probably actually having to pull up to drop the torpedo from their attack run height at which point as we said the, you've got this curtain of fire above you and if you've pulled up you given it's night time you may not be going 100 percent straight and level you may have a slight nose up attitude and then you drop your torpedo torpedo weight goes off the torpedo enters the water aircraft pops up again it's entirely possible that that might then carry you up into the into the level of the AA fire. And because contrary to some the way some films would have you believe, not every round is a tracer round. Um, you could quite easily have a portion of your aircraft fatally damaged and never see the round coming, especially at night until you turn away. And you're like, oh, but that, that part of my wing used to be there. Um, in, this, in this particular instance, he was one of the first two to three swordfish into the harbour so this was when they were still firing low enough to hit each mm. other and again charles lamb writes about what he saw of that opening moment he says he saw a swordfish beneath him outlined amongst the the glow on the harbour he says i watched it i watched it wing its way through the harbour entrance five thousand feet below and disappear under the flak and imagined that it had been shot down at once then I saw the lines of fire switching round from both sides, firing so low that they must have hit each other. The gun aimers must then have lifted their arcs of fire to avoid shooting at each other. And I saw their shells exploding in the town of Toronto in the background. The Italians were forced, were faced with a terrible dilemma. Were they going to go on firing at the elusive aircraft right down on the water, thereby hitting their own ships and their own guns? And their own harbour and town or were they going to lift their angle and fire still more so um, with that i imagine that what he is seeing there is not necessarily that aircraft l4a but he was watching that first group of three enter the oh, harbour yeah. and the and the consequences that that entailed or, or initiated which was mm. the, the the shell fire hitting the tower hitting other ships so the reality is the swordfish isn't quite at level it should be turned into a living deity. But in fact, there's no aircraft which is at the level it should be turned into a living deity. Sorry. The Hornet. The sea Hornet. No. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, look, there... it, was, it was Brown's <laughs> favourite aircraft. Yes, that doesn't mean living deity. And is. there is also, oh, it's well, not a world war, it it's not a sort of terrible aircraft either. It's in, it's in the middle. It's an okay aircraft. And it's very good at this point because it's attributes help it up. And no, for the Sea Hornet, not a living deity. No. It's too anyway, fast to other... collect sacrifices anyway. Huh? It's too fast to collect. Yes. It's too fast to collect any sacrifices you might leave for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so the other two swordfish that were flying um, in that first strike dropped their torpedoes also at Cavour. I am saying that right, am I? Conte yeah, de Cavour. De Cavour, Conte yes. de Cavour. Yeah, it's not um, Cavour, but... which I called it for a long, very time, <laughs> a very long time. Um, both missed. How is, you know, up there with the. Um, technology gods so it could have been that they simply ran too deep could be that they simply ran wide could be that the duplex torpedoes didn't get a strong enough magnetic signature off the ship of, uh, to detonate but they were both um, reported to explode not far from andrea doria in the mud uh, near there when they ran reached the end of their, their run but um, both those swordfish managed to do a tight 180 degree turn in the middle of the harbor and sneak up the way they came well not so much sneak but you know weave their way out the way they came uh again large pretty much untouched that's actually another thing you have got to remember when you're talking about planning this strike why does the first strike which is 12 aircraft include only six carrying torpedoes two carrying 250 pound bombs 
a pair of them and flares and four carrying six 250 pound bombs. Well, the reason is there's not that much space in the harbor for torpedo bombers. And they have to do these maneuvers and these things, and you can't have them all going in there at once. So if especially you're going you've to got, have it going on, you, especially when you've got balloons sense. and cables. Yes. And honestly, the 250 pound bombs, they don't get enough coverage. We're always talking about the battleships which get hit. But these bombs do a lot of damage. Fuel. Not many of, not many of them explode. Well, the ones, the ones uh, that hit the fuel tanks worked reasonably well, but the ones that hit the warships tended not to explode. We'll leave that to one side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, uh, the, the thing is, yes, they didn't explode, and there are some issues with that. I, there's a whole sort of discussion about why they didn't explode. What? Because these bombs, actually, 250-pound bombs, were fairly reliable as British bombs go at the beginning of the war. So why poor Illustra seems to be carrying a crop of ones which don't go off suddenly? You have to wonder whether was there a mistake in their arming? Were they not being, were, you know, it, they have a sort of height they're supposed to sort of spin and get to before they go off. So if the thing is that they're being dropped below that height, it's kind Falkland of like, the Falk <laughs> yes, it is. It's the Falklands War scenario. Again, these bombs, the planes are flying as low as they can to get in underneath the flak. They're dropping the bombs and the bombs are being dropped too low for them to arm. And that would explain what happens to them. And also would explain why people like Lamb, who are flying higher, managed to do their job on the refineries quite so well. Because they're mostly fl flying around doing things. And honestly, they're not being paid much attention to when they go in. As he said, he felt that he was the safest job in the house. You know, when they get, they're going in over the refineries, most people aren't really watching what they're doing. They're going, oh, they're coming in with more torpedoes. They're coming for our battleships. Anyway, the the poor old loft swordfish that had arrived early and not noticed his um, compatriots fly past and initiate attack sees everything going on and you know, guns and makes his own attack. But he arrives uh, probably a good... Yeah, he he enters the harbour as the other two survivors are leaving, so it's probably not the best time to be to be making your attack run. Um, well, you know, right there as everybody are worse else is times there. to be there. <laughs> um, so he goes into the harbour again at wave top height, um, bounces over the um, breakwater. Uh, he wrote in his after action report that he distinctly noticed that most of the flak was going well and truly over his head. Um, and he also noted that there was no searchlights. So he singles out Vittorio, um, which had been lit up um, from behind by the flares as they fell lower. And you know, he, did a, he did a, you know, this time he did a, he did another hard left turn. What is it about the lefties? Mm -hmm. and um, dropped his torpedo just 400 yards off him from Victoria. Um, it was a close run. He says he flew between Victoria's masts to get out. Um, but as he did so, the torpedo detonated on the uh, Victoria's side. So it was you know, out of that run, you've got one hit on Cavour, one in Victoria out of four swordfish. That's not, not, not bad. bad. Not a bad ratio of hits, really. And uh, also, there is something about the left turn, because we're making a joke of it, but there is actually a real thing for it. When pilots are controlling an aircraft, they're like this. And so if you go left, that's more natural to your hands. It's one of the reasons why on aircraft carriers, the islands are always built on the starboard side. Well, unless you're the Japanese who try it the other way and then find problems. They try it both ways, Be yes. Yeah, and they, they do. They do. Uh, because if the turn is more natural to that direction, if an aircraft is in trouble, for a pilot to turn away, that is the more natural turn for them to make if they're in trouble. The trouble is if you have the, if you have the island there, they go straight into the island. Whereas if you have the island on the other side, they're going away from the island. It's good naval architecture, therefore, to put your island, if you're going to have one on your carrier, on your starboard side. Talk, yeah. I think is the yeah. term, is it? Not the... Uh... 
Yeah, yeah and yeah. also it does help that the aircrafts also their sort of the way their propellers turn also tends to also take it that way as well. So it's they with the aircraft with the motion of the pilot, and everything is easier if it's going left. So actually, if you do want to make a harder turn in a propeller aircraft, believe not, you can usually make a slightly harder turn turning to left. There's only yes. fractions in it, but it's if you want to make a really harder turn, you can turn more harder to the left. Mm. It's also the natural it, reaction to snatch your hand away from something that's in danger, so... Yeah. Uh, this torpedo run actually assists the, 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 the second flight. Um, two more swordfish come in right on his tail. Um, they have a reasonably easy run of it, so they're able to pick their targets. Uh, without too much distraction. Um, one drops on Latorio as well, but misses. And I think the other um, dropped as well, but also misses. So in the end, you've got three misses, four misses and two hits. So yeah, the ratio is not great, but hey, look, these guys are having to zigzag. Jink, they've got they've got um, balloons, they've got torpedo nets, they've got random barges with uh, machine guns stuck on them, and scattered through the harbour. They've got destroyers and cruisers and battleships shooting at them. So I think you know um, it's not a bad effort for. The and I have to say, the only if I was ever asked as a what if scenario of how I would improve Toronto, I would say. I would like some more swordfish to take part, but actually those swordfish I wouldn't be arming with bombs or torpedoes. I'd have them putting some mines in there to deal with the recovery and repair efforts uh, because they really are doing well. But I think they get to about the limits of what they can achieve with the torpedoes under the circumstances and with the bombs under the circumstances, again, because yeah. of the level they take to take them out. Whereas mines are the one thing you could add into that scenario for afterwards and go, that would have caused quite a bit of trouble. And what, what, whilst whilst we've obviously talked about the fact that the, the alignment of the various ships being a bit all over the place means they're at significant risk of shooting each other, it also does have a certain amount of, I guess, one can call it necessarily salvation, but it has an in, it means there's an increased effectiveness um, against being hit by the torpedoes because. If you go back to the Pearl Harbor, a Pearl Harbor type scenario where you've got all the battleships lined up, yes, it means they can use all their AA um, to shoot at you uh, on that facing side. But it also means if you drop a torpedo and you're aiming for the battleship in the middle of that row, if your torpedo veers a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, chances are it's going to hit something else in the line. Um, there's very small chance of it slipping in between. Whereas with the Italian ships all laid out in seemingly, obviously not necessarily a random pattern, but it looks it looks very random when you look at it from above. It means that uh, every time you want to attack an uh, Italian ship, if your torpedo misses, it misses. There's there, there's nothing either side to for that for that torpedo to hit. And if you're setting up an attack run to go in broadside on a one ship you can't then if you miss or your torpedo malfunctions or the anti-aircraft fire is a little bit too hot you can't just pull to one side slightly to attack another ship you're having to make a decision i'm going for this ship and this ship alone and it's either, it's an all or nothing at that point yes which is com and, which is problematic and i was actually wrong um one of the two aircraft in that second flight um, L4K did actually manage to hit Notoria as well. So it's actually a, pretty much a 50% hit ratio out of that first wave. Which is actually better than the Japanese will pull off at Pearl Harbor. By a long we'll get, margin. We'll, we'll get to that later on. <laughs> um, but yeah, what you were saying before, look, you, these ships are darkened, except for when they're firing, of course. Mm -hmm. But you know they're in a in a harbour which is surrounded for two thirds of its arc by 
hills. So you've got black hills, dark ship, dark sky with a moon peeking through seven tenth cloud. So picking out your targets is not going to be easy. In this instance, they were lucky because the um, flares from the initial drop had, had got to a lower point where these battleships were backlit. The other earlier advantage on, is they're firing at you. And, and earlier on, you couldn't really see them because the swordfish are flying at water level, <laughs> but these battleships are being illuminated from above. So it's you know, there's much less um, of these things being you know, illuminated around you. So you know, picking a target in this scenario is not exactly easy. I, I'm not sure, you know, all it takes is for you to walk around um, a, a dark area with minimal lighting. And you'll notice it's very easy to trip over and not, not exactly figure out where the gate is mm. or, where, the, or where, where you left your car. Well, add to that all the other uh, confounding factors in this scenario. And um, yeah, no wonder sometimes they had to do a ultra hard turn and drop at point blank range um, because, you know, yes, you can feasibly miss a battleship in this scenario. <laughs> so the bombers, the, 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 the dive bombing attack, three of them, um, you know, theoretically was an easy target because you have all these destroyers packed side by side, cruisers in among them, um, a couple of heavier cruisers, uh, Trieste and Bolzano, if I'm getting the pronunciation mm -hmm. right. They are the ones actually in the um, in the harbour. Yeah. Uh, Trento was there as well, but um, these three heavy cruisers they very quickly realised that they were in the centre of the harbour. That there was a lot of gloom around them, and for exactly what I was saying a minute ago, they stopped firing because they realised then that there's just no way that these guys could see them unless they dropped flares directly on top of them, um, which basically forced the swordfish pilots to. Focus on either the row of destroyers and cruisers or the seaplane base. So these are much easier to see because they're actually part of the main part of the land. You've got your, um, you can see the water glistening and the hard darkness of the land, so you can get an idea as to where these different areas are. Um, one strike goes against the um, the Seaham, but the seaplane base and the bombs again land among the hangars and the storehouses so they didn't necessarily take out aircraft but they did damage to their facilities fires and again as we go as i mentioned earlier the maintainers the they might have been in bed by this hour but, uh, <laughs> might have been in bed but if you take out their stores and also yes. the, the maintainers might have been in bed but will all the stores clerks and all the people who are organizing those stores have been in bed if yes. you're doing these operations as you know Again, also the maintainers, they're only have been in bed if all the aircraft are able and serviceable ready for tomorrow. And if they're not, they're up maintaining them so that they can get take off the next day. Well, you know, the Japanese went after the airfields at Pearl Harbor to to make it harder for um, them to locate the carriers and um, organize a counterattack. So I suppose it's a similar thing here. Two seaplanes were burnt out. So you know, I suppose you want to, if you just want raw kills, well, they've still got two aircraft in that run. <coughs> um, but the bad luck against the um, cruisers and destroyers, yeah, they score possibly some hits. We're not really sure which aircraft hit which ships, but you know, um, a couple of a couple of them had bombs pass through their rupture fuel tanks, but not go off. Um, you know, I, I mean, guess chance, it, it, it's going to sound strange the, from those stories and I, I might be wrong on this again because I'm going from memory of notes in terms of this one because when I was looking up the re, uh, researching for our talk I, I did focus in on certain things and my memory from when I was doing a PhD in the story was those were armor piercing bombs which hit destroyers and therefore possibly didn't actually have enough to set them off, but actually themselves going through caused quite a lot of damage. Um, yeah, so, up. I mean, in this instance, yes, they did hit a one destroyer, um, the Becchio. Uh, again, they just passed straight through. Um, yes, it did do things like rupture fuel tanks, cut, you know, um, various important piping and um, lines, but um, 
I guess it's you know, if it doesn't detonate, those things are things that can be repaired with minimal you fossil. The building in, in, and you destroy it, that's or, or replace or replacing a bow. You know, mm. it's, yeah, it's very different. So they're not and, like uh, HMS Eskimo. And and to be honest, with when you've got a a hole through your ship, that's easier to contain with bulkhead doors and everything than it is if the bomb has exploded. Because with a bomb exploding, you can have potentially hulled bulkheads, warped door frames, started seams, etc. Whereas mm -hmm. as long as your crew's on point with their damage control, you can usually guarantee that if you've got a hole punched through the ship, um, that any decently designed warship will will be able to contain that to a certain degree. I mean, you, and if you you're could... alongside, you're not even <laughs> worried about you know loss of life mm. really, because you can get ashore quite quickly you can so use stabilization i'm sure you can even get cranes if you want to in to hold it up and you can compare and contrast actually on a much larger scale the effects of the fritz x later in the war because you have the fritz x that hits roma explodes and that's the end of roma after a very short amount of time um whereas you have the fritz x that hits war spike and even though war spike is a physically smaller ship and the hit is in a bis in an area where if it had detonated almost certainly would have been in the proximity of the magazines because it punches straight through the ship and goes off into the water to detonate although it does inflict a fairly catastrophic amount of damage war spite survives where roma doesn't there's there's just so many variables <laughs> mm. people want to know why things don't happen nice and cleanly in war well everything's got a variable attached somewhere Anyway, while this is, you know, this is all finishing now, the, the swordfish are, are leaving, but still circling up above is Charles Lamb in his um, aircraft. He's a bit worried because he's lost sight of every other swordfish in the confusion. He's convinced that he's the only survivor. <laughs> so, uh, so the quote is this, all the top brass will want to know exactly what happened and whether the attack was a success and how many hits were scored and so on. And if we're the only survivors, they will expect us to know. This is why he's staying up in the sky and orbiting the um, Toronto Harbour. Frankly, I saw nothing apart from the flak which covered the whole harbour. I couldn't see beyond it. So that's his. In, that, that's the intensity of the fire. And he's uh, his um, observer says this from the back seat. You were throwing the aircraft about like a madman half the time, and every time I tried to look over the side, the slipstream nearly whipped my goggles off. The harbour was black, blanketed by ACAC, and I had to check with the compass to see which way we were flying. So he's trying to see what's going on down below. He can't see the other swordfish, and all he's seeing is flag. And he, he stays over the harbour for probably a good 5 or 10, 15 minutes longer than designated because he's trying to see what's happened and he's trying to see if there are any survivors so eventually lamb turns around and heads back to illustrious picks the, gets the signal from the rotating beacon and is quite depressed he's he's convinced that he's the only pilot to have made it which i guess makes sense you know if <laughs> with that degree of firepower uh it's only when he's pulling into the landing pattern so at this point, um, about midnight or after midnight, for by the time they get back, the way that um, the Royal Navy did night landing operations was for the carrier to drop <clears throat> at regular intervals little buoys with flares on them. So these would be sort of like uh, a trail of crumbs. So the radio signal would guide the swordfish towards the aircraft carrier from that nifty little trick about the ping going off at exactly the same time as your your little hand on your watch pointing towards where it is um, but once they get close enough they see this these breadcrumbs of flares and it's only when they start flying along these flares towards the back of the carrier that the carrier turns on its lights now its lights are all hooded so that they can only be seen from above and behind the carrier a big concern of everybody, of course, is to uh, torpedo boats, submarines, 
other warships. So you don't. This want is one of the reasons up. why you actually only do night operations when you have to. The British maintained a skill, as I've said before, throughout World War II. But if you don't have to do a night operation, you really don't because a it allows you to rest your crew, and b it's very, very dangerous to be the only thing which is lit up and has a trail of, of visible breadcrumbs to you in the middle of a dark night where you possibly can't see the enemy coming. And uh, on the final approach, you've got a batsman with a light bulb attached to his chest and light bulbs attached to his bats. So you've got three points of reference to, so you can figure out whether you're too high, too low and he brings you into land as per usual. So yeah, it's it's not exactly ideal, but um, they've they've covered all their bases. You've you've got long range tracking back to the carrier, medium range to figure out where the carrier is and what its course is. You follow the path and you they turn on the lights and you get that narrow beam, and then you get your final approach. Um, so yeah, the swordfish that are still in the air make it home. No, without too much problem. But while the, even before this happens, the second wave is already in the sky. Um, not without incident, because unfortunately for the final two swordfish, and these are the two that are configured to be um, bombers, the uh, overly enthusiastic, uh, possibly a little bit confused because they can't see the signals in the night, um, deck crew remove the chocks of one of the swordfish a little bit too early, and it rolls into its companion. So the prop slices into part of the fuselage. And naturally, the crew of the second aircraft aren't all that happy about this. <laughs> the, here they are, their big moment, and their swordfish is damaged. Um, the aircraft take off. The aircraft that did the rolling into the, um, into the one that caused the damage also takes off. And the final swordfish is quickly dashed below, stashed below via the forward lift. Um, crew races up to the bridge and says, get us back up in the air, get us back up in the air. <laughs> and within 20 minutes, they've fixed the string bag. So, you know, uh, a few new tensioned wires, a few bits of whatever the British equivalent of masking tape was. <laughs> and this um, dive bombing string bag is ready to go again. All Not hail quite. the aircraft engineers! Engineers, uh, <laughs> those mechanics, yeah, they, they got it going. So he—that's the also, real British secret weapon of World War Two and every other war since. He, he also does the same thing. He pushes that Pegasus engine beyond its uh, ratings to design spec to make it to allow it to catch up. Unfortunately for the aircraft that caused the carnage in the first place. Whether it was caused by the impact or not, we don't know. But this was this had a um, underslung fuel tank between the, the wheels, the traditional sort of uh, uh, amount. The forward strap of that breaks and the uh, fuel tank starts to dangle beneath the, the, the swordfish and slap against the fuselage. So they had no choice but to turn around and go back. I don't really want to be flying at low level with a, a uh, well, or any level that, for that matter with a <laughs> hard attached. I, I do understand this, but I also feel that that torpedo tank really was just trying to become a torpedo. <laughs> I feel that drop tank had decided that, frankly, it was in the torpedo position. It wanted to be a torpedo. That was, um, I think, the that was L5Q was that particular one. The one that had uh, got back up into the air was um, L5F. So it wasn't, you know, this is a smaller strike because a couple of the aircraft were missing from having fallen into the sea due to um, uh, contaminated fuel. And at this point, you know, it's looking like it's already two aircraft further down, but one of them gets up. So, you know, it's not um, quite as bad as it could be. Let's, uh, to quote Jamie in his own, in the notes he provided, because this there is actually, this lovely thing is Jamie's notes. Again, bilge pumps, we often, we, we, we sound like we're sort of unrehearsed just talking, but actually, no, we, we do have notes usually compiled by Jamie. We, we just and usually don't pay attention to them, that's all. No, we don't. <laughs> uh, L5F broke the swordfish speed record to catch the formation as the attack run order was given at 1150. So that's so when it broke the, the swordfish speed record just after having been damaged. 
Having aircraft which are easy to repair and maintain and keep operational is critical to still having an air group, not on day plus one of the war or day plus two, but day plus seven, day plus 14, day plus 20. That is what the Swordfish is designed for. That's the Swordfish's real superpower. The fact it's able to be easily fixed. One of the things that surprised me when I started my uh, obsession with um, the armoured aircraft carriers was when actually Mr. Illustrious was bombed off Malta and she suffered that raging inferno in her hangar for a good 13 to 14 hours. Um, the two or three swordfish at the other end of the hangar were all repaired and put back into service. Yeah. Despite smoke damage, despite uh, sprayers, despite foam, despite, despite flying splinters of fragmented aircraft and um, fire curtains, um, they, they still managed to get a couple of those aircraft back up into service. So, and yeah, that matters. String, bag, string bags, there's a lot of holes in them. They, they can still they can still uh, hold their stuff. And Drax sitting there quietly, and you just know he's got something to say. Yeah, well, I was just I was just going to say it, again. It's it shows that as we were discussing before, it's like just because it's a, a biplane and it's fabric and wood and a bit of metal doesn't mean it's completely obsolete from uh, the perspective of World War Two. Because it's it's a lot easier to get back up in the air. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it, to a certain to a certain extent, actually, it's um, it reminds me of some similar issues that you have when you compare and contrast uh, the Hurricane and the Spitfire, or the Wellington and the Lancaster on land, because the Spitfire's wonderful performance, but completely stress skin metal frame. The Hurricane is a kind of a halfway house between modern des design and a lot of canvas still. And the Hurricane's much easier to repair and turn around. Um, if you, I remember reading, from, uh, I can't remember where it was. It was a book about the Battle of Britain, but they were pointing out that if you, if you took a bunch of machine gun fire or cannon rounds to the wing, as long as it hadn't hit anything vital like a wing spar on a hurricane, you could patch up with a few squares of canvas and a bit of dope and the hurricane could be back up in the air the next day. Whereas if you torn a bunch of holes in the wing of a Spitfire, you pretty much had to replace the wing. Because yeah. you, you could, in theory, patch it with a bit of sheet metal, but that would significantly affect the performance characteristics of the aircraft. And and similarly here, um, and in as you say, and in the fire, at, fire situation as well if you can patch your swordfish up and get it back up and working well having a torpedo bomber that functions at the capabilities of the swordfish is a lot better than not having any at all <laughs> that being said let's face it you know um those capabilities applied at night <laughs> mm -hmm. so not that any torpedo bomber ever actually did any well against uh, fighters no um whether it be in the English Channel or um, off Midway, um, but it's yeah the, the the swordfish yeah it was it had a narrow margin of, uh, of um, performance shall we say a narrow margin of success as and the again, key was is to, to to exploit that narrow margin. And as we point out again, how often is it that an aircraft gets to be deployed in the exact scenario it was designed for? Mm -hmm. But, this is the thing. We, this is why we the might, we, we might have to ask, so well. We might have to ask that question of uh, any F thirty five designer we um, get to interview at, at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, so five torpedo bombers in a second wave. Mm -hmm. but they arrive shortly after midnight, so half an hour after the first strike is finished. Naturally, the harbour is pretty much stirred up by this point. Um, you've got two battleships that have been hit. Um, you've got at least one destroyer that's been hit in the internal harbour, and you've got a burning sea base, sea base, and you've got burning fuel tanks. And you've so, got a lot of noise, a lot of things going on, which means you're not necessarily going to hear these aircraft coming in as well as you would do earlier. This is you've got the scenario that you've got a lot of people going around trying to fix things, a lot of lights on, a lot of stuff being done, a lot of people exposed 
because it's just been the right enough time for people to think the attack's over. We can start to repair. We can start to assess the damage. You also have a lot of top brass turning up and wandering around. (laughs) Maybe not that quickly, but yes, I know what you mean. Um, But yeah, these guys are flying into the to the mouth of of the stirred dragon, though, aren't they? Maybe medium high, dro- medium high brass turning up, knowing <laughs> that the top brass were brass we're visiting soon. Yes, they do. I think that they make, well, they make a different um, approach. I think they come in a bit more over the town in the second round. Um, but yeah, it's the same scenario in many ways. You've got balloons to dodge. You've got ships to dodge that, um, and torpedo nets to fly around. Um, again, in this scenario, the first wave flies into the teeth of, of, of danger. One of the first swordfish, one of the first swordfish, is hit. Uh, it seemed to veer sharply across the bow of a, another uh, swordfish and plunge into the water. Um, this particular swordfish, there was no survivors. Um, it's believed that it probably did get to drop its torpedo because a torpedo that had no other cause to be where it was 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 found floating alongside of um, a heavy cruiser the next morning. It's believed it uh, bounced off the side of the cruiser without detonating, so it might have been dropped too soon. But um, um, its companions continue on through the maelstrom and uh, one of the pilots, one of the pilots or crew, uh, Torrance Spence in E4H says, as he approached um, one of the battleships, the flash of her close range weapon stabbed at us. As first we'll one and then another along her length opened up. We were in the center of an incredible mass of crossfire from the cruisers and battleships and shore batteries. Wasn't E4H the one that was hit? Uh, oh, sorry, yes, you're right. E4H is the one that was hit. It was L5K. It was Torrent Spence and, and the Observer Sutton. Yeah. The reason I was remembering it was because I remembered because you, this is again Jamie's notes, and this was something I hadn't even oh. known about before I saw Jamie's notes, but then I went up and looked it up. L5K has trouble getting rid of their torpedo. It won't go. So they bounce the wheels on the water to shake it loose. So in other words, can you imagine doing this in any other aircraft than a swordfish track? Bouncing your aircraft on the surface of the sea to drop your torpedo because it won't to, go to, loose. To shake it loose. <laughs> that's, that's that flexing you were talking about earlier. Of the, uh... Yeah. Would you <laughs> just, do that in anything else? I'm, I'm, just, imagine, I'm just imagining now the, observ- the, the <laughs> observer-rear gunner hauling himself out on a string on a, on a line hanging upside down from the aircraft with a hammer just hitting the torpedoes like why won't you go away actually here's the thing we've been over the fact the observers are way steep in fuel mm. right not all, still, not all of them not all of them but the ones in the <laughs> torpedo aircraft are way steep in fuel roughly um and we've been over the fact that, that so they are, have definitely fuel saturated, if not still with fuel pooling in areas at this point going in for this attack. And then you, the pilot, is bouncing the aircraft off the water to drop the torpedo, and the guy behind him is covered in <laughs> aviation fuel. I am. Not sure what would happen it's, it's, to that pilot once I got back to the carrier. It, I think he would be getting bumped as the bare minimum. It, it would certainly be making me think twice about the career decisions I've made. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be asking myself where my life went wrong. What happened to me to be in this circumstance? It's not so. It's not certain whether it was that torpedo or of his wingman uh, in L five A, but um, one of them does actually hit um, Torigo. Mm. So, because they were flying alongside of each other, dropped at the same time. Even though he had to balance his aircraft, it's not easy to tell 
you know, which which aircraft was which. And um, yeah, I guess they didn't really actually put identification tags on the torpedoes either for the Italians to mm-hmm. pick up afterwards. <laughs> um, oh, you've been hit by number three torpedo. Take a receipt. <laughs> Please send the Royal Navy notifications so they can award me my medal for the hitting York battleship. <laughs> You've just been struck by a torpedo. How would you rate this experience on one to five stars? <laughs> <clears throat> These swordfish escaped by flying between Fiume and Zara. Mm-hmm. So once again, the two heavy cruisers couldn't open fire because they'd be hitting each other. Um, second, second flight of torpedo bombers come through. Um, one of them, E5H, actually hits a barrage balloon cable. But this one wasn't attached. So it seems that somehow or another during the battle, one of the one of the, the um, barrage balloons have broken loose. So fortunately, this uh, swordfish strikes the cable, the bottom of the cable that's dangling loose. So it's just another hole in the fabric. It's not a situation of tearing the wing off, which it could, so easily could have been. This is going to sound terrible, but I'm noticing a small pattern which I would like to point out here. So far, any aircraft which has H for its final (laughs) letter designator doesn't seem to have a good experience. So my policy from now on is if ever I'm in an aircraft which has the name H as its final designator, I'm going to be getting out. Um. These guys hit. E five H managed to. Uh, well, it's the one of the uh, the drops on Veneto, but misses. L five mm. F the um, the bomb configuration rate is setting a speed record in a swordfish aircraft. Managed to hit Trento, but they his bombs failed to explode. I'm they, at that point. I'm surprised the swordfish crew didn't land and get on in fury and start hitting well, the crew. I imagine they were fr- after they all that effort. Enough. <laughs> um, being frustrated enough, yes. Uh, but uh, the, the, you know, once again, yeah. it's a situation where the, the torpedo, where the string bag had to do a 180 degree turn, basically, with any, and yeah. the pilot says, with one wing dragging in the water. Um, but he, he misses. He misses Veneto. Um, so you know, yeah, it's tough. It's but hey, the frustration it's, it's, of the torpedo of the swordfish crews after going for all that and then having this happen must have been tremendous. And E5H again, with the luck of the H's, gets hit by a shell in the lower port wing. Um, the shell explodes, breaking the wooden ribs, tearing a hole in the fabric, but yeah, nothing dramatic. Yeah, nothing mm. dramatic. She's lost a portion of wing. She still to make it back to the aircraft. That's why. That's why the biplane has four wings. <laughs> yes, you it weaves, it weaves its way out. Weaves, it way, weaves its way out of the harbour and vibrates all the way back to um, Illustrious. Mm. Um, so but, look, the, the, the second attack is just as successful as the first um, in terms of well, almost as successful as, successful as the first in terms of ratio of hits. Um, still frustrating in terms of actually doing any damage with those 250 kilogram bombs against ships. But um, let's put it this way. It was a worthwhile effort. And they also make their way home. By this time, Lamb has landed on the deck and to his complete and utter amazement, the forward deck part is full of swordfish that have returned in front of him. And um, these guys also return with only one aircraft having any sort of slight ac- uh, having a slight accident on landing at night. So, which is again a very impressive feat. Uh, the hours they're flying for, the fact uh, the navigation feat again. Uh, the point you have to emphasize: Why does the why do the British have multi seater fighters? Why do they have the observers, navigators along, and all these aircraft? It's because they can do long range night navigation. If you have someone flying an aircraft at night, is very very taxing. Even if you're not having to dodge enemy fire, navigating as well with the equipment you have available at the time. Remember, these days the pilots they have GPS, they have all sorts of computer and other navigation systems. 
1940, you haven't even, I don't think even Oboe has come into existence, and that would be based uh, from the UK to support operations mm. in Germany. And that requires a huge land station to provide its basically a radio beacon projected out. So this is all in, you know, these navigators are, the observers are navigating these aircraft based on a compass, a ruler, a projector, a pencil, and the br their own brain. They've got and a couple watch. of... Eight, and, mm. and their lunch, yes. Their lunch. Watch, 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 yeah, the watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said lunch, I was like, yeah. The watch <laughs> does come in helpful for the beacon, but, mm -hmm. you know, all these things... It's, cool. and mm. it, it, it's just... It's a feat beyond which you cannot really understand unless you have to do it. If you've ever taken your a boat out anywhere or taken a plane out anywhere or just got lost before you had GPS on your phone. <laughs> it's hard to remember. That those is days, nowhere it? near, you know, what it's like. But that mm. was the scenario. That reminds well, me of it's... a pre pre phone days when I had to navigate through London. <laughs> <laughs> at that point i just remembered roughly where the moon was supposed to be at the at the, that time of night and used it as a as a gigantic sky compass my students have no concept of why i know where all the tube lines go without having to look at my phone and how i and it's sort of, they, they don't understand you know, my students i am not i'm okay i'm older than them but not uh, maybe a decade <laughs> or so just a little bit over a decade old most of them and it's a case of they are in their time frame. It has now become the thing they do not need to understand the tube map to get around London. Mm. Their phone will tell them. And and this is the pace of change that they're experiencing at this time. Yeah. So you know the the, the dramatic difference between an operation in 1940 and that of 1945 is just worlds apart. Mm. You can't compare the two. But, you know these slow old swordfish. This this mission. Each swordfish was in the air for roughly six and a half hours. You know, they're, they're not the fastest aircraft, but you know, time to get to target, time over target, time to find your carrier and land on six and a half hours. That's going to tire out anyone, really. <laughs> so you know, the fact that only one of those aircraft has an accident upon deck landing. And that was simply because the guy accidentally opened his throttle up a little bit too much and bumped into the aircraft in front of him. It mm. wasn't as though he ploughed into the deck. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it shows that these guys had done their training. They'd done their time. They knew what they were doing. And they had the equipment and the, um, the facilities to, to get the job done. Mm. 